Book One. Siddhartha Gautama Hava Bodhisattva became a Buddha. Part One From Birth to Parivajja. Part Two Renunciation Forever. Part Three In Search of New Light. Part Four Enlightenment and the Vision of a New Way. Part Five The Buddha and His Predecessors. Part 6. The Buddha and his contemporaries. Part 7. Comparison and contrast. Part 1. From birth to Parivajja. Book 1. 1. His Kula. Going back to the 6th century BC, northern India, did not form a single sovereign state. The country was divided into many states, some large, some small. Of these, some were monarchical and some non-monarchical. The monarchical states were altogether 16 in number. They were known by the name of Anga, Magadha, Kasi, Kosala, Uriji, Mala, Chedi, Watsa, Kuru, Panchala, Matasya, Surasena, Asamaka, Avanti, Gandhara and Cambodia. The non-monarchical states were those of the Sakyas of Kapilavastu, the Malas of Pava and Kushinara, the Lichivas of Vaisali, the Medas of Mithila, the Kolias of Ramagam, the Bullies of Alakapa, the Kalingas of Resaputta, the Mauryas of Pipa Latvana, and the Bagas with their capital on some Sumara hill. The monarchical states were known as Janapada, and the non monarchical as Sangha. Or sang or Ghana. Not much is known about the nature of the polity of the Sakyas of Kapilavastu, whether it was republican or oligarchic. This much, however, is definitely known that there were many ruling families in the Republic of the Sakyas and that they ruled in turns. The head of the ruling family was known as Raja. At the time of the birth of Siddhartha Gautama, it was the turn of Siddho Dana to be the Raja. The Sakya state was situated in the north-east corner of India. It was an independent state, but at a later stage the king of Kosala had succeeded in establishing his paramountcy over it. The result of this paramountcy was that the Sakya state could not exercise certain sovereign powers without the sanction of the king of Kosala. Of the kingdoms then in existence, Kosala was a powerful kingdom. So was the king of Magadha, Basenadi, king of Kosala, and Bimbisara, king of Magadha were the contemporaries of Siddhartha Gautama to his ancestry. The capital of Sakyas was the city called Kapilavastu, perhaps after the name of the great rationalist Kapila. There lived in Kapilavastu a Sakya by name Jayasena. Sinahu was his son. Sinahu was married to Kachana. Sina, who had five sons, Sudodana, Dotodana, Sakodana, Sukko, Suklodana, and Amitodana. Besides five sons, Sina, who had two daughters, Amita and Pamita. The daughter of the family was uh, Adaita. Sudodana was married to Mahamaya. Her father's name was Anjana and mother's Sulak Shana. Anjana was a Kolia and was residing in the village called Devadaha. 
Suddhodana was a man of great military prowess. When Suddhodana had shown his martial powers, he was allowed to take a second wife and he chose Mahaprajapati. She was the elder s sister of Mahamaya. Suddhodana was a wealthy person. The lands he held were very extensive and his retinue under him was very large. He employed, it is said, 1,000 ploughs to till the land he owned. He lived quite a luxurious life and had many palaces. Through his birth, to Suddhodana was born Siddhartha Gautama, and this was the manner of Gautama's birth. It was a custom among the Sakyans to observe an annual midsummer festival which fell in the month of Ashad. It was celebrated by all the Sakyas throughout the state and also by the members of the ruling family. It was the usual practice to celebrate the festival for seven days. On one occasion Mahamaya decided to observe the festival with gaiety, with splendour, with flowers, with perfume, but without drinking intoxicants. On the seventh day she rose early, bathed in scented water, bestowed a gift of four hundred thousand pieces of money as alms, adorned herself with all precious ornaments, ate choicest food, took upon herself the fast day vows, and entered the splendidly adorned royal bedchamber to sleep. That night Suddhodana and Mahamaya came together, and Mahamaya conceived Lying on the royal bed, she fell asleep. While asleep, she had a dream. In her dreams, she saw that the four world guardians raised her as she was sleeping on her bed and carried her to the table land in the Himalayas, placed her under a great sal tree and stood on one side. The wives of the four world guardians then approached and took her to Lake Manosarovar. They bathed her, robed her in a dress, anointed her with perfumes and decked her with flowers in a manner fit to meet some divinity. Then a bodhisattva by name Sameda appeared before her saying, I have decided to take, to take my last and final birth on this earth. Will you consent to be my mother? She said, yes, with great pleasure. At this moment Mahamaya awoke. Next morning, Mahamaya told her dream to Suddhodana. Not knowing how to interpret the dream, Suddhodana summoned eight Brahmins who were most famous in divination. They were Rama, Daga, Lakana, Amanti, Yana, Suyama, Suboga, and Sudata, and prepared for them a befitting reception. He caused the ground to be strewn with festive flowers and prepared high seats for them. He filled the bowls of the Brahmins with gold and silver and fed them on cooked ghee, honey, sugar and excellent rice and milk. He also gave them other gifts such as new clothes and tawny cows. When the Brahmins were propitiated, Sudhodana related to them the dream Mahaya, Mahamaya had and said, tell me what it means. The Brahmin said, be not anxious, you will have a son, and if he leads a householder's life, he will become a universal monarch, and if he leaves his home and goes forth into a homeless state and becomes a sannyasi, he will become a Buddha, a dispeller of illusions in the world. Bearing the Bodhisattva in her womb like oil in a vessel for ten lunar months, Mahamaya, as her time of delivery was coming nearer, desired to go to her parents' home for delivery. Addressing her husband, she said, I wish to go to Devadaha, the city of my father. Thou knowest thy, that thy wishes will be done, replied Suddhodana. Having seated her in a golden Palanquin, born by couriers, he sent her forth with a great retinue to her father's house. Mahamaya, on her way to Dewa Daha, had to pass through a pleasure grove of sal trees and other trees, flowering and non-flowering. 
It was known as the Lumbini Grove. As the palanquin was passing through it, the whole Lumbini Grove seemed like the heavenly Chitalata Grove, or like a banqueting pavilion adorned for a mighty king. From the roots to the tips of the branches, the trees were loaded with fruits, flowers and num- numberless bees of the fine colours, uttering curious sounds and flocks of various kinds of birds, singing sweet melodies. Witnessing the scene, there arose a desire in the heart of Mahamaya for the halting and sporting therein for a while. According she, accordingly, she told the couriers to take her in the cell grove and to wait there. Mahamaya aligned from her palanquin and walked up to the foot of a royal cell tree and a pleasant wind, not too strong, was blowing and the boughs of the trees were heaving up and down and Mahamaya felt like catching one of them. Luckily one of the boughs heaved down sufficiently low to enable her to catch it. So she rose on her toes and caught the bow. Immediately she was lifted up by its upward movement and being shaken she felt the pangs of childbirth. While holding the branch of the cell tree she was delivered of a son in a standing position. The child was born in the year 563 BC on the Vaishaka Parni Made. Sudotdana and Mahamaya were married for a long time but they had no issue. Ultimately when a son was born to them his birth was celebrated with great rejoicing with great pomp and ceremony by Sudot Dana and his family and also by the Sakyas at the time of birth of the child it was the turn of Sudot Dana to be the ruler of Kapilavastu and as such was in the enjoyment of the title of Raja naturally the boy was called Prince for visit by Asita at the moment when the child was born, there dwelt on the Himalayas a great sage named Asita. Asita heard that the gods over the space of the sky were shouting the word Buddha and making it resound. He beheld them waving their garments and coursing hither and thither in delight. He thought, what if I were to go and find out the land in which he was born? Surveying with his divine eyes the whole of the Jambud. Vipa Asita saw that a boy was born in the house of Sudodana, shining with all brilliance, and that it was over his birth that the gods were excited. So the great sage Asita, with his nephew Nardata, rose up and came to the abode of Raja Sudodana and stood at the door of his palace. Now Asita the sage saw that the door of Sudodana's palace Many hundred thousand beings had assembled. So he approached the doorkeeper and said, Go, man, inform the Raja that a sage is standing at the door. Then the doorkeeper approached Sudot Dana and with clasped hands said, Know, O Raja, that an aged sage, old and advanced in years, stands at the door and says that he desires to see you. The king prepared a seat for Asita and said to the doorkeeper, Let the sage enter. So coming out of the palace, the doorkeeper said to Asita, Please go in. Now Asita approached the king, Sadot Dana, and standing in front of him said, Victory, victory, O Raja. May you live long and rule thy kingdom righteously. Then Sadot Dana, in reverence to Asita, fell at his feet and offered him the seat. And seeing him seated in comfort, Sudot Dana said, I do not remember to have seen thee before this, O sage. With what purpose hast thou come hither? What is the cause? Thereupon Asita said to Sudot Dana, A son is born to thee, O Raja, desiring to see him, have I come? Sudot Dana said, The boy is asleep, O sage. Will you wait for a while? The sage said, Not long, O king. 
do such great beings sleep? Such good beings are by nature wakeful. And did the child, out of compassion for Asita, the great sage, make a sign of awaking? Seeing that the child had become awake, Suddhodana took the boy firmly in both hands and brought him into the presence of the sage. Asita, observing the child, beheld that it was endowed with the thirty-two marks of a great man and adorned with the eighty minor marks, his body surpassing that of Sakra Brahma and his aura surpassing them a hundred thousandfold. Breathe forth this solemn utterance, marvellous, verily, is this person that has appeared in the world. And rising from his seat, clasped his hands, fell at his feet, made a right-wise circuit round, and taking the child in his own hand, stood in contemplation. Asita knew the well. Asita knew, knew the old, well-known prophecy that anyone endowed with the th- with the thirty-two marks of a great man, as Gautama was, has two careers open to him, and no third. If he becomes a householder, he will become a universal monarch. But if he goes forth from the home to a homeless life, he will become a fully enlightened Buddha. Asita was sure that the child would not remain a householder, and looking at the child he wept and shedded and shedding tears sighed deeply. Sudodana beheld Asita shedding tears and sighing deeply. Beholding him thus weeping, the hair of his body rose, and in distress Sudodana said to Asita, Why, O sage, dost thou weep and shed tears and sigh so deeply? Surely there is no misfortune in store for the child. At this Asita said to the Raja, O king, I weep not for the sake of the child, there will be no misfortune for him, but I weep for myself. And why asked Sudodana? Asita replied, I am old, aged, advanced in years, and this body will, without doubt, become a Buddha and attain supreme and complete enlightenment, and having done so will turn the supreme wheel of the doctrine that has not been turned before him by any other being in the world, for the wheel and happiness of the world he will teach his doctrine. The religious life, the doctrine that he will proclaim, will be good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, complete in the latter, and the spirit whole and pure. Just an as, just as an Odumbara flower, at some time and place, arises in the world. Even so, at some time and place, after countless cycles, revered Buddhas arise in the world. So also, o Raja, this boy will without doubt obtain supreme, complete enlightenment, and having done so, will take countless beings across the ocean of sorrow and misery into a state of happiness. But I shall not see that Buddha. Hence, O Raja, I weep, and in sadness I sigh deeply, for I shall not be able to reverence him. The king thereafter offered to the great sage Asita and Nardata, his nephew, suitable food, and having given him robes, made a right-wise circuit around him. Thereupon Asita said to Nardata, his nephew, When thou shalt hear, Nardata, that the child has become a Buddha, then go and take refuge in his teachings. This shall be for their weal and welfare and happiness. So saying, Asita took leave of the Raja and departed for his hermitage. Death of Mahamaya On the fifth day, the ceremony of the name-giving took place. The name chosen for the child was Siddhartha, whose clan name was Gautama. Popularly, therefore, he came to be called Siddhartha Gautama. In the midst of rejoicing over the birth and the naming of the child, Mahamaya suddenly fell ill, and her illness became very serious. 
Realising that her end was near, she called Sudodana and Prajapati to her bedside and said, I am sure that the prophecy made by Asita about my son will come true. My regret is that I will not live to see it fulfilled. My child will soon be a motherless child, but I am not worried in the least as to whether after me my child will be carefully nursed properly looked after and brought up in a manner befitting his future. To you, Prajapati, I entrust my child. I have no doubt that you will be to him more than his mother. Now do not be sorry. Permit me to die. God's call has come and his messengers are waiting to take me. So saying, Mahamaya breathed her last. Both Sudodana and Prajapati were greatly grieved and wept bitterly. Siddhartha was only seven days old when his mother died. Siddhartha had a younger brother by name Nanda. He was the son of Sudodana, born to Maha Prajapati. He had also several cousins, Maha Nama and Anuruddha, sons of his uncle Sukolodana. Ananda, son of his uncle Amito Dana and Devadatta, son of his aunt Amita. Maha Nama was older than Siddhartha and Ananda was younger. Siddhartha grew up in their com- company. 6. Childhood and Education When Siddhartha was able to walk and speak, the elders of the Sarkis assembled and asked Suddhodana that the boy should be taken to the temple of the village goddess Abhiya. Sudhodana agreed and asked Mahaprajapati to dress the boy. While she was doing so, the child Siddhartha, with a most sweet voice, asked his aunt where he was being taken. On learning that he was being taken to the temple, he smiled, but he went, conforming to the custom of the Sakyas. At the age of eight, Siddhartha started his education. Those very eight Brahmins whom Sudodana had invited to interpret Mahamaya's dream and who had predicted the fu- his future for his teachers. After they had taught him what they knew, Sudodana sent for Sabamita of distinguished descent and of high lineage of the land of Udika, a f- philologist and grammarian, well read in the Vedas. Vedangas and Upanishads. Having poured out water of dedication from a golden vase, Sudodana handed over the boy to his charge to be taught. He was his second teacher. Under him Gautama mastered all the philosophic systems prevalent in his day. Besides this, he had learned the science of concentration and meditation from one Bardawaj, a disciple of Allah Kalam, who had his ashram at Kapilavastu, seven early traits. Whenever he went to his father's farm and found no work, he repaired, he repaired to a quiet place and practiced meditation. While everything for the cultivation of the mind was provided, his education in the military science befitting a Kastia was not neglected, for, for Sudodana was anxious not to make the mistake of having cultivated the mind of his son at the cost of his manliness. Siddharth was of kindly disposition. He did not like exploitation of man by man. Once he went to his father's farm with some of his friends and saw the labourers ploughing the land, raising buns, cutting trees, etc., dressed in scanty clothes under a hot burning sun. He was greatly moved by the sight. He said to his friends, Can it be right that one man should exploit another? How can it be right that the labourer should toil and the master should live on the fruits of his labour? His friends did not know what to say, for they believed in the old philosophy of life that the worker was born to serve and that in serving his master he was only fulfilling his destiny. The Sakyas used to celebrate a festival called 
Vapra Mangala. It was a rustic festival performed on the day of sowing. On this day, custom had made it obligatory on every Sakya to do ploughing personally. Siddhartha always observed the custom and did engage himself in ploughing. Though a man of learning, he did not despise manual labour. He belonged to a warrior class and had been taught archery and the use of weapons, but he did not like causing unnecessary injury. He refused to join hunting parties. His friends used to say, Are you afraid of tigers? He used to resort, retort by saying, I know you are not going to kill tigers, you are going to kill harmless animals such as deer and rabbits. If not for hunting, come to witness how accurate is the aim of your friends, they say. Even such invitations, Siddharth refused, saying, I do not like to see the killing of innocent animals. Prajapati Gautami was deeply worried over this attitude of Siddharth. She used to argue with him, saying, You have forgotten that you are a Kashtri Kshatriya, and fighting is your duty. The art of fighting can be learned only through hunting, for only by hunting can you learn how to aim accurately. Hunting is a training ground for the warrior class. Siddharth often used to ask Gautami, But mother, why should a Kshatriya fight? And Gautami used to reply, because it is your duty. Siddharth was never satisfied by the answer. He used to ask Gautami, tell me, how can it be the duty of a man to kill man? Gautami argued, such an attitude is good for an ascetic, but Kshatriyas must fight. If they don't, who will protect the kingdom? But mother, if all Kshatriyas loved one another, they would not be able to protect their kingdom without resort to killing. Gautami had to leave him to his own opinion. He tried to induce his companions to join him in practicing meditation. He taught them the proper pose. He taught them to fix their mind on a subject. He advised them to select such thoughts as, May I be happy? May my relations be happy? May all living animals be happy? But his friends did not take the matter seriously. They laughed at him. On closing their eyes, they could not concentrate on their subject of meditation. Instead, some saw before their eyes deer for shooting or sweets for eating. His father and his mother did not like this partiality for meditation. They thought it was so contrary to the life of uh, Kshatriya. Siddhartha believed that meditation on right subjects leads to development of the spirit of universal love. He justified himself by saying, when we think of living things, we begin with distinction and discrimination. We separate friends from enemies, we separate animals we rear from human beings, we love friends and domesticated animals, and we hate enemies and wild animals. This dividing line we must overcome and then we can do when we in our contemplation rise above the limitations of practical life, such was his reasoning. His childhood was marked by the presence of supreme sense of compassion. Once he went to his father's farm during recess, he was resting under a tree enjoying the peace and beauty of nature. While so seated, a bird fell from the sky just in front of him. The bird had been shot by an arrow which had pierced the body and was fluttering about in great agony. Siddharth rushed to the help of the bird. He removed the arrow, dressed it its wind and gave it water to drink. He picked up the bird, came to the place where he had, was seated and wrapped up the bird in his upper garment and held it next to his chest to give it warmth. Siddharth was wondering who could have shot this innocent bird. Before long there came his cousin Devadatta, armed with all the implements of shooting. He told Siddharth that he had shot a bird flying in the sky. The bird was wounded, but it flew some distance and fell somewhere there. 
and asked him if he had seen it. Sudart replied in the affirmative and showed him the bird, which had by that time completely recovered. Devadatta demanded that the bird be handed over to him. This Siddhartha refused to do. A sharp argument ensued between the two. Devadatta argued that he was the owner of the bird because by the rules of game, he who kills a game becomes the owner of the game. Siddhartha denied the validity of this of the rule. He argued that it is only he who protects that has the right to claim ownership. How can how can he who wants to kill be the owner? Neither party would yield. The matter was referred to arbitration. The arbitrator upheld the point of view of Siddhartha Gautama. Devadatta became his permanent enemy. But Gautama But Gautama's spirit of compassion was so great that he preferred to save the life of an innocent innocent bird to securing the goodwill of his cousin. Such were the traits of the character found in the early life of Siddharth Gautama.